Looks like we're live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another recreational programming session. How about that? Uh, let's make a little bit of an announcement and officially start the stream. So I hope my microphone is working right. So um, a red circle live on uh, Twitch. And what are we doing today on Twitch? Let me see. Today we're doing 3D in C without OpenGL um, on the CPU. In fact, we're not using any GPU APIs like Vulkan, Metal, or anything. We're doing everything on CPU today, and it's going to be rather interesting. So let me give the link to the Twitch channel where we're doing all of that. Twitch.tv slash Sodium, and I'm going to ping everyone who's interested in being pinged. Uh, there we go. The stream has been officially started. So uh, today we continue series on developing the uh, Alivets, which is the um, uh, graphics library, um, which renders everything into the memory, right? So it doesn't have any dependencies. You just give it a chunk of memory and you tell it what to render and it will render all of that pixel by pixel into that memory. So you can do whatever you want with that memory. You can save it as an image, you can render it using OpenGL or anything, right? But the uh, construction of the pixel itself is not on um, on GPU, it's on CPU anyway, right? So it's a, it's a very simple library that uh, basically just fills up the memory. You can find the source code of this library in here if you're interested and for um, and for uh, people who are watching on YouTube, you can find that in the description. Um, all right, so let's take a look at the uh, at the source code of this thing. All right, so let me rebuild everything just in case. Uh, Doruk Sega, thank you so much for three months of tier one subscription. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello, everyone. Really glad to see you all. Hello, 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 hello. All righty. So we have a bunch of demos, right? We have a bunch of demos that demonstrate what you can do with this specific library. In fact, uh, this library is so simple and doesn't have uh, any dependencies. You can compile it to WebAssembly and run it in a browser. So yeah, that's what simplicity gives you. People do not understand that, right? So they're trying to build like, uh, like very complex abstract systems. But if you strip off stuff from the system, they become more cross-platform, right? Because the more dependencies you have, the more probability that some of the dependencies is just not available for that specific platform. The less dependencies you have, the more cross-platform your application is. If you can achieve the same thing with less dependencies, you make the application not only more simple, but also more cross-platform. People just don't understand that for some reason. I don't know. They think that to make things cross-platform, you have to make the thing more complex. It's actually the opposite. Anyway, right. So let me actually show you. Uh, HTTP server 6969, right? So, and uh, these are the things that the library can do. Right, so it can do uh, Bresendi coordinates interpolation, right? So that allows you to do the rainbow triangle. This is not OpenGL, by the way. This is like on CPU pixel by pixel. Transparency, gradients, stuff like that. No OpenGL, uh, only CPU. So we have a simple 3D, but 3D projection on the screen is not done by the library. We'll just do that uh, manually in the demo itself, right? The library only provides a way to render a dot uh, on the projected place, right? So, but this is just like a demo to, to look impressive, right? But today I want to go into uh, something more interesting, right? As you can see, this is a projection of just a single dots, a single points in 3D space. I want to actually render like a solid objects in 3D, right? Like a, like a solid cube and stuff like that using that library. And we can already try to do that, right? We already have an ability to render triangles, right? As already demonstrated in here. So essentially, you can already render 3D triangles, right? So if you have vertices in 3D space, you just do this kind of projection and you just render projected triangle like this, right? But uh, there are some problems with... Um, um, you know, properly rendering the intersecting triangles, right? But we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, so, and this is precisely what I want to try to do today. I want to try to just take a triangle and make it a 3D triangle. I want to try to render a triangle in 3D and see how it will work, 
Right. So, and recently we implemented Barisendian coordinates for triangle interpolation. Uh, for more information on that, I recommend to watch a previous stream. And that is going to be very useful when we're going to start uh, rendering intersecting stuff. Right. So I'm going to show you later. Okay, so we also have like, uh, you know, resizing of the of the textures and stuff like that. And all of these demos, by the way, they're available online. Uh, you can find them in here if you're interested. So, Olivet. So, this should work on your own machine. So, let me go to the description and I'm gonna actually put it in here. So, uh, demos. This is a source code and these are demos. Um... Uh, now, okay, so to start doing 3D, I think I want to recall the math of projecting 3D point onto the 2D screen, right? So to do any 3D without any libraries or, or any dependencies or OpenGL, we need to understand the math, right? So I want to understand the math for... 2D projection a little bit better, right? So we already, like on, on the previous stream, we did a little bit of LaTeX, right? Where we explored uh, Borisendian coordinates and uh, we ended up with this PDF uh, white paper that is available for everyone, uh, right? And I want to do a similar paper, but for the 3D projection, right? Just, just explore how you do 3D projection and come up with the formulas. And then we're gonna use that formulas to project a triangle in a 3D space, right? So uh, let's go ahead and try to do that. I'm gonna create 3D projection. Um, yeah, well, let's call it 3D projection. I'm gonna call it tech. It's not text, it's tech. Uh, 3D projection tech. All right, so document class, and we're gonna do article. Uh, article, and we're gonna start the document environment, and let's just do hello world. Uh, maybe even a section, right? Because section is big, so it's gonna be <laughs> very much visible. It's it's kind of funny how this latex mode is just like trying to like trying so much to be what you see is what you get editor but kind of fails miserably like it's 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 what you see is what you get but not all the way through you know what i mean <laughs> right it's just like so weird um not sure i'm not sure if it's even helpful um but, but anyway whatever uh it is what it is uh okay so pdf later and uh 3d pdf tech <clears throat> all right uh, but uh, but later is all about what you get is what you want. Yeah, exactly. Like I don't know why people are trying to turn later in into what you see is what you get. If you want what you see is what you get, just use Microsoft Office or whatever, right? So it's not about that, uh, right? It's a completely different philosophy, if you know what I mean. What you see is kind of what you get, but not real. Not really. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, let me see if we manage to compile that properly. Uh, okay, so there we go. Here is hello world. All right, so I also probably want to put some sort of a uh, thing behind my camera so I know what you guys see or do not see. Right. Um, there we go. So I know if like, yeah, so I cannot see the same thing you cannot see. Uh, all right, so 3D projection. Uh, 3D projection, right, and I can quickly recompile the entire thing and I can change it and as you can see 3D projection. Okay, so uh, I really liked how in barycentric, barycentric, barycentric coordinates, I need to learn how to pronounce that word, it's a really difficult word for me to pronounce, right, uh, right. So what I wanted to show you is uh, the PDF in here, mu PDF. Um, yeah, open it on really Jesus. Right, so as you can see, we have an image here. And the thing about this image is that it's vector, right? So you draw with the command, with the later command, right? So I want to draw the, like how projection works um, using like a similar thing, right? So let's actually draw first the, the axis, the, the coordinates of some sort. Uh, so 
we draw that with a package called uh, use package. I think I forgot how it's called. Ticks, right? Uh, it's called ticks, and you have to do ticks picture, right? So this is the environment in which you're drawing everything, uh, right? So let's actually try to recompile. We can't see anything because we didn't issue any commands to draw, right? So we have to do draw, and the line is done usually by providing two points, right? So let's provide the point. Let's draw a point from minus five zero to uh, five zero, right? So, and this is gonna be horizontal line, right? So this is gonna be X axis, uh, right? There we go, and there we go, we, we have a line, which is pretty cool. Um, so, latex fits this time, yeah, I'm sorry. You, you can Google it yourself if you want, I mean, come on. Um, all right, so let's actually draw the Y axis. Uh, so this one is gonna be zero minus five. And uh, let me see how it is going to go. There you go. So I think it's a bit too big, at least on Y. I don't want Y to be this big. Uh, let's actually make it from minus three to three. All right, around like that. And uh, what I essentially want to do, I want to place uh, an eye, the viewer's eye at, uh, at zero, zero. Then I want to draw a screen right onto which we're projecting everything. And then I want to draw a sort of like a 3D object. In this case, it's 2D because we're looking from the side. Uh, I want to put an object behind the screen and I just draw the line, how it projects onto that virtual screen. And from there, we'll be able to derive the formula that you need to use to actually do that in a program, right? So that's basically going to be the idea. Um, right, so maybe I'm going to actually move uh, this thing to the left, right? Because we're looking into the positive direction, right? So it probably makes sense to actually like do minus three in here. Uh, right, there we go. So maybe even two, but this one is gonna be something like seven. There we go, right. Cool. So let's try to draw um, a circle at zero, zero. Right, so this is going to be zero, zero, and this is the circle. And as far as I know, you have to provide the size, and it's in some sort of like a really weird measure unit it's called EX. I don't really know what they, uh, what they mean, but I know that 0.5 is the size that I want for a marker, right? So, and it actually drew a circle in here, but it's a actually empty circle. This is not particularly what I want. If I remember correctly, I can provide the style in here. I can say fill, uh, and it will put like fill, fill it up. There we go. So then we can put a node with the text above that object that says that this is an eye, right? So this is where we have an eye. In fact, uh, I think I can even put the axis in here. So this one uh, is a Y axis, right? So this is a Y axis. Uh, can I actually make it a little big? I can even make it bigger. That's actually pretty cool. So this is the maximum. So this is a Y axis and this one this must be a Z axis, right? So because we're looking into the Z, um, right, there it goes. So let me, let me actually find, right. So this one is gonna be Z axis. Yeah, there we go. So we're looking into the Z and above us is Y. So X is actually goes like that straight into through this thing. We would be able to see X instead of Y, only if we look like above, uh, like above the the player, above the viewer, so to speak. Uh, but let's actually use Y in here because I think I wanna look at this thing from the side, if that makes any sense. Uh, it will be also kind of cool to draw the arrows here for Z and Y. So let me actually Google that. Uh, ticks, um, latex arrows, because I don't remember how to do that. So ticks arrows. Ticks blocks. Hmm, nice. Stealth arrows. That's a really weird way of doing that, but okay. I mean, if it works, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's gonna work or not. Uh, stealth. Okay, so it, it actually drew, the, uh, drew them. So it didn't draw them on the other ends. Okay, that's perfect, actually. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I really like that. Uh, so, okay. Um, let me try to now draw the screen, right, so to speak. Uh, you know what? I would like to actually 
like take all of these magical values and turn them into like um, later command so I can refer to them in other drawings, right? Because for instance, I want to draw the uh, screen, right? So, and the screen is going to be vertical line. Uh, it is going to be located somewhere at, let's say two, right? And in terms of um, Y, it's going to go from the minimum y that we have in here, right, minus three, and then uh, two to maximum y. And uh, let's actually draw it like that. If something went uh, given up on this path, uh, I forgot the semicolon, so that's basically what happened. Okay, so as you can see, this is the screen. It would be nice to actually denote that this is a screen above screen. There you go. So it will say this is a screen. So we have an eye and we have a screen. We can clearly see everything. It would be nice if it had a different style, for instance, dotted, right? So yeah, so now it is dotted, but it's actually kind of difficult to see. So let's actually make it thick, right? It's dotted and thick. Okay, so but, but the problem here is that what if I want to change the height of the whole thing, right? So for instance, I'm going to do from minus two to two, uh, right? And that means I should not forget to update the screen. It would be nice if like, uh, you know, minimum Y and maximum Y were some sort of a variable that I could refer to in both of these places. So every time I change it, like it changes automatically, you know, stuff like that. And in fact, and later you can do that, you can define a certain command. Let's define minimum Y and say that it's going to be minus three, right? And then we can define maximum y, which is going to be 3. And we can just like literally use those things in here. Minimum y. It has a different weird syntax. I, I do admit that. But later by itself is kind of a weird language. Uh, this is probably because it's so old. By the way, have you noticed how old languages are weird? Probably because like back then there was nothing standardized in terms of syntaxes, right? So these days, all of the syntaxes for all of the languages sort of converge into like C-like, uh, right? So the format is C-like, which is called JSON. All of the new languages like C-like languages and stuff like that. It's kind of interesting. The older a certain language is, the more weird it is in terms of like a syntax. Right. So, but the more modern languages are, the more we start to converge them to the same syntax anyway. Mm, Fix screen is just like oh, good old days, yeah. Mm, it's like old human languages sound weird. I don't know. I never heard old languages. Mm -mm -mm. Anyway. So, and now I can do something like this. Um, right. So let me try to recompile the entire thing. And there you go. So now it should be quite easy for me to update the minimum uh, Y and minimum X. And it updates both of these lines simultaneously because I uh, refer um, to the same variables in here. So, which is kind of convenient. Which probably makes sense to maybe uh, introduce like minimum Z and maximum Z. You know what I mean? Uh, like so. For all of these variables, it, uh, for all of these values, it makes sense to introduce like a special uh, special command. I think, I think it does make sense. So minus two and seven. So I can also group them into pairs, right? So this is a minimum y and maximum y, and this is minimum z and maximum z. Uh, this one is a minimum z, and this is a maximum z. There we go. Right, seems to be working. Seems to be working. And now I can specify the screen Z, right? And the screen is located at two. So, and I can use the same command in here once. Screen Z. Which means that now I can quite easily move the screen around. I can put it in here or I can put it in here. I can put it anywhere. It doesn't matter. It automatically updates. Right, and uh, it still works even if I change the, uh, you know, the axis, like everything works. Can your CSS do that? I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, CSS recently introduced variables of some sort, so it should be possible. Uh, Robledop, thank you so much for Twitch Prime. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, all right, all right, all right, all right. 
so old English, for example. Uh, I don't know, like, in that sense, it's just like old uh, English sounds as weird as a foreign language, right? So, if the language is so old that you, a modern person, do not recognize it, it's basically a different language, and for you it sound as, sounds as weird as a different language. Right, so... I don't know. I hate how every package have absolutely different syntax. For example, ticks have a semicolon, but other packages don't. Oh, that's interesting. I, I never tried anything except ticks. So I'm not aware of that. So I'm not the later person. I don't use later daily. So I use it occasionally from time to time. But I think I'm starting to use it more and more because I just realized at some point that it is way more convenient to do math not on the paper, but on a computer. And with the later, I can actually make it look like I did it on paper. You know what I mean? Right, and it's convenient to do it on, on a computer because I can copy paste chunks around and just uh, search and substitute. I can like literally transform expressions the way I cannot do on a pen and paper without uh, making a mistake. Uh, right, it's way easier for me to just copy paste things around and transform them and be sure that I didn't make any mistakes. And on top of that, I can just display it nicely. So it's just like the best of both worlds for me. Um, the later has a later has a really weird syntax, but I mean I think it can be get used to it. I, I've tried a lot of different languages with different syntaxes, so uh, I would say it's not the worst language I programmed in. But I'm I'm not programming this language anyway. Whatever. So uh, let's now uh, put some sort of a um, point behind the screen, right? So let's put a point behind the screen. So I'm going to call this point P, so it's going to have X, right, so actually it, we have Z and Y, right? So in terms of Z, it's going to be at 3, basically behind the screen. Uh, I could have put it like this, screen Z, like plus 3, but I don't really want to do that, right? Uh, I want to have a little bit of a control, right? So I want them to be independent. Like I don't want them to, I don't want to make them dependent yet, right? We'll see if it will be needed. Uh, P, Y, in terms of Y, it's going to be maybe like one or two, like above the uh, Z axis somewhere here. Uh, right, and you know what I just realized? Z and Y in here, they don't look mathematical at all. They are mathematical value. So let's actually wrap them in dollars, which will use the special font for math, right? So as far as I know, in nodes in here, you can literally put anything later. You can even put like mathematical expressions and they will be displayed properly. So which is a kind of nice. Uh, right, so yeah, look at this Z now. Look at that, look at Z, look at this Y. It looks so beautiful, so mathematic. Like you just like, you just drew it with your hand. Farkon, hello. Uh, so, hello, hello. Mm. Mm, I cannot paint pretty Greek letters. My later uh, expression uh, equations look uh, therefore much better than paper ones. Yeah, exactly. It's it's the same for me. Uh, Raffalo thirty eight. Thank you so much for three months of your, uh, of Twitch Prime subscription. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Cheers. Mm -mm -mm. Alrighty. So maybe I actually want to make this a little bit shorter, uh, maybe like six. Uh, yep, that's pretty cool. Okay, so let's draw that point, right? So I know that we can put it in here. This is going to be PZ and PY. Mm, and we're going to call it P. And since it's a mathematical value, I'm going to call it like that. Uh, all right. So it's located somewhere here, so it's actually a little bit too high uh, for my liking, so let me make it like one. Uh, yeah, that's perfect. So what we want to do in here, we want to actually draw a line from I to P and see where on the screen it intersects. Right. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, we're going to do draw, it's going to be dotted line. And we're going to be rendering from the eye. So I just realized that for the eye, I don't really have a special coordinates. I didn't define them. So let's actually quickly define them. I, uh, I, Z, so zero. Both of them is going to be zero, but I mean, we should have an ability to change them if we want to, right? So we're going to define A, I, Y. And let me do I, Z, I, Y. 
And then we're going to take the eye and we're going to draw this thing into point P. So I'm not sure if I need uh, any any stuff, any label. Uh, there we go. So, and essentially what we need to do, we need to find this specific point of intersection uh, of this line from I to a point, so some sort of object P onto the screen, right? So, and uh, we should have the following things, right? So let's actually you know that I, where is the I? Uh, has a specific letter, right? So I want to call it E, but unfortunately E is already like a constant, right? So maybe it's going to be like a capital E, right? So, and the thing about P is that uh, it's a vector, right? It has three coordinates, PX, uh, PY, and P, uh, PZ. Uh, something like this, and E, is basically the same, but I'm gonna replace this thing like that. Uh, so something went wrong. Oh, we don't have a line environment because we need to use another another package, right? So Lady who was actually first who suffered from the NPM disease, right? So you usually have like a shit ton of packages to here to just like do a basic things. But there is a huge difference between Later and NPM and like any other package manager out there for programming languages, there's a huge difference. So in later, it is totally fine to have shit ton of dependencies for your document. You know why? Because as soon as the document compiled, you don't need any of these packages for that document to work. You know what I mean? In case of, for example, Rust, you have shit ton of dependencies that link with shit ton of other libraries, of dynamic libraries and stuff like that, and you end up with executable that need them at runtime. So you have to bring them in. You need to bring them in. There's like no other way around. And with LaTeX, it's, it's not. You just compile it and you forget about all of your dependencies, no matter how many of them you use, because the final thing is just like whatever you display. You see what I mean? Like, there is a huge difference between this NPM disease in LaTeX in, and in any other language. Because in LaTeX, the end document just does not depend on any of that, so it doesn't matter. And it makes sense, because the PDF document is not the same as an executable program, right? So they are completely different entities, they serve completely different things, so that's why it's not the same. Um, all right. Uh, Prince Goof, thank you so much for Twitch Prime. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, AMS Math, I think. Uh, all right. So let me let me try to recompile this entire thing. And there you go. Here is the stuff. Uh, but it would be nice to also align them right uh, by the beginning of the of the line, like so. Uh, right, there we go, so they, or, uh, they look aligned. Okay, so given these coordinates, can we find that projection somehow? Right, so let's actually find out. Um, so we're gonna call that point, uh, that projection point as P prime. So uh, let me just draw that. I'm gonna draw a few. Um, so I don't really know where in terms of Y it is located, but I know for sure that in terms of Z it is located at this screen Z, which means I can do screen Z and I'm going to put zero for Y for now. I'm going to render the circle, uh, right, I'm going to render the circle and then above that circle I'm going to print, uh, to print P prime, there we go, okay. So here's the point, but this is not the point of the projection. So we know the Z of that point. We need to find the Y of that point, right? We need to find the Y. And here we have a line. So that means to find that Y on this line, we need to know the, uh, the line equation, right? So we need to know the line equation of this uh, specific thing. So the line equation, if I'm not mistaken, is y multiplied by slope uh, equal to slope multiplied by x plus c, right? So that's basically what we have. So slope is effectively y divided by x, right? So y divided by x, and in terms of c, 
uh, c is equal to, so if you basically move this thing back in here, it's y minus k x, right? And usually it's any point, right? So, but we can uh, pick the first one. Uh, so, and in here, um, it's probably going to be 2 minus y1, and this is going to be uh, 1 minus maybe y2 minus x1. Right, so this is difference between them. So y2 basically point to the second point in here is p. But the first one, the first one is i. So we can actually put all of this stuff in here, right? So effectively, uh, we take screen z, the x, and we need to multiply it by the slope, right? So we need to multiply it by the slope and slope is uh, p uh, y minus i y divided by uh, p z minus i z. Right, there we go. So it's not particularly visible in here because the formula is rather long, but here is the slope. We multiply it by the x in here, in, in this case it's z. And then we have to add uh, we have to add c, and c is going to be i y minus the slope yet again uh, minus the slope yet again. So it's going to be actually kind of big. It's going to be actually kind of big. So let's actually try to simplify it first. So if I put uh, if I put c in here, I end up with two um, members in here with the same coefficient, which is k, right? So I can bring them in here and I can basically uh, put them like that. There we go. So that means I need I don't need the second, uh, the second slope in here. So here is the slope and I multiply it by z minus uh, iz, right? So minus iz plus iy. And that formula should compute me the y based on z, right? So knowing the formula for the uh, for the line, that should actually work. So let's actually see. And uh, oh, I think I think I know what's up with that, right? So if you want to have like I remember that. Um, so parentheses in ticks have a special meaning. So you cannot use them for mathematical expressions and stuff like that. So if you want to do mathematical expression, you have to wrap them in curly braces or something like that. I remember having a problem uh, like this. Uh, let me let me give it a try. And there we go. So we found the point of intersection with the screen perfectly. And you know what's cool? Since it's procedurally generated, that means I can change the screen, I can make the screen a little bit far away, and that point in here is automatically recomputed. So it was actually kind of a dumb idea. I should have not changed the screen, I should have changed the uh, the position of P. Right, there we go. So as you can see, I can change it however I want, and the projection changes accordingly, right? So I can make it like three, and it in fact changes so it recomputes everything right so if i want to adjust some things um you can just do that and everything automatically is recomputed um uh, so that's pretty cool um but it's not particularly it doesn't really demonstrate how 3d projection works right for a 3d projection it would be nice to actually have like at least two points in here, right? So this is one point. How about the second one? Let's actually put the second one onto the onto the axis. So this is going to be P1, and this is going to be P1 prime, right? So let's actually make P1, P2 the same as P1, but with a negative y, right? So basically, they will form some sort of a line, if you know what I mean. Uh, right, so this is going to be the same, but Py is going to be just minus, and this is going to be called P2. Uh, right, so as you can see, it is now located in here. Uh, right, so, and that means um, we also need to draw a line, of course, but this is going to be, uh, be minus Py. Uh, there we go, so here is that. And in terms of projection, in terms of projection, we're also going to copy paste this thing, but P2 prime is going to have a negative y, right? So that's the whole difference. 
And uh, so you can imagine that you have some sort of like a 3D object. Uh, 3D object. And this is how it looks projected onto the screen with your eye located in here. So I'm going to show you something interesting, right? So look how the projected image changes as I change this 3D object uh, behind the screen, right? So if I make it like a little bit far away, this is how it changes. And now I'm going to make it a little bit closer. So it creates a very interesting effect. The, close, the more far away the object is, the closer it is to the center. And you, you know, you've noticed that. When you look at the world, the more far away the object like, uh, actually appears, the more to the center it is. Right, so they all sort of vanish at the center. So, and now if I like increase the Z from the screen yet again, you can see how these two dots approach the center. They all send, uh, like vanish at the center. And this is precisely what creates this 3D effect. You can clearly see that. And it's actually kind of cool that you can almost interactively just play with that thing. Uh, right. So, what's funny is that, what's funny is that, while we were drawing this diagram, we basically reinvented that formula. We already using that formula to draw the diagram. So, we can just go ahead and copy-paste that formula, essentially. Uh, right, so, um, the formula to find uh, let's say p prime uh, specifically y, right? Uh, so this is going to be aligned. So here it is. Um, essentially, um, you have p y, right? So let's actually quickly replace uh, p y with p underscore y. So this is the first one. Uh, then we replace y with e y. This is that one. P z p underscore z mm. I z e z so i'm not sure about this screen z how are we going to denote that uh, maybe it makes sense to actually call it s z uh, right there we go and by doing that you effectively get uh, p prime y or maybe you have to do it like this right? p prime y there we go so mm. So here it is, here is the formula, but of course, it probably makes sense to actually get rid uh, of this dot. Uh, we can actually bring this dot in here, right? And then we can use a fraction, right? We can do frac, uh, like so, uh -huh. and get rid of this star. So that's basically the formula, right? So where P is basically the point behind the screen. Uh, everything E is the position of your eye, and um, S is the position of the screen in, in Z, right? Because it's like, it has only Z, right? Because it's a plane, effectively. <clears throat> so that, that's the formula, essentially. What's interesting is that this formula really doesn't care um, what's how you look at it, right? So we look from the side, but uh, now we want to do the same for X. How do we compute the X? Well, we look from a bow, uh, right, like so. So now this is X and we're looking from a bow uh, and the formula is the same. You just replace Y with X, right? Um, so we're gonna just do it like that and I'm gonna clearly replace Y with X. And this is precisely why I prefer doing math on a computer these days because I can just do that. I have a similar formula. It's just like you have to replace one letter with another one. With the pen and paper, I have to, you know, rewrite that formula and not forget to replace Y's with X's in, on the computer and I have to think about it. I just copy pasted it and just replaced it. Easy. Uh, never have to make a mistake ever again. Uh, all right. And it's not even specialized software. That's what's interesting. So you can already do math way more effectively just by using computer without any specialized software. Without. Imagine what if I start using specialized software. 
I'm gonna be unstoppable. Literally unstoppable. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sorry. Anyway, so um, this is the second thing. So let's actually say formula to find um, P prime. Right. Uh, okay, let's take a look. So here, here it is. So it, maybe it makes sense to actually uh, pull it, uh, you know, into the, um, how is that called? The system of equations, I don't know. Uh, something like this. And it's going to be cases. I think that's how it's called. Uh, right, so it looks a bit compressed. Uh, I'm not sure if introducing cases was actually very useful because it looks like kind of small now. Uh, so this looks a little bit bigger. Um, yeah, that's fine. <clears throat> okay, so that's pretty cool. So that's basically the formula. Uh, you know what's interesting is that um, we can assume your eye being always at the same place, right? W which sounds kind of weird, right? So like you're supposed to move around. If you're gonna assume that your eye is located in the same place all the time, how you move around and stuff like that. This is the trick. In computer graphics, uh, you never move the viewer, the player, whatever you wanna call them. The player always stays in the same point. You move the whole world, right? That's how you usually do that. So uh, if uh, a player or a viewer have a particular position in space and a particular rotation within that space, you rotate and move the whole world, and then assuming the uh, the player being at zero zero zero, you just project on on their screen, uh, like a spaceship in Futurama. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's how you usually do graphics, right? You don't move the player, you move the whole world because it's just easier. Right, in, in a computer world, right, in a computer specifically. In the real world, things work a little bit differently. But who knows? Who knows? Like, I heard, I'm not a physicist, but I heard that physicists say that the universe expands uh, equally everywhere. Right, so, which basically, so when you hear that the universe expands, like, wh what is the center of its expansion? It expands relative to what? And apparently, from what I could understand, it expands everywhere equally, right? So at any point in the space you can see, that point, it expands relative to that point. You move to a different point, it expands relative to that. Like, it expands everywhere simultaneously. It's like you're blowing a balloon, right? You're inflating a balloon. And each point on that balloon, they are getting apart from each other equally. Right. This is what I understood. I'm not a physicist. I might be wrong, but again, right. So to sort of like demonstrate the similarities between like computer graphics, right, uh, where you move the whole world, right. Uh, yep, you're right. Oh, you, you mean you're a physicist? You know that? Okay, that's cool. We have actual physicists in here. Mm -mm. It's semantics only because it does not really matter if you have world matrix or user. I don't really like to think in terms of matrices uh, when I do graphics. I think matrices only obscure things, right? Because matrices, what do matrices do? The matrices are a way to encode operations on vectors, like in computer graphics at least, right? So they are a bunch of operations already compressed and encoding, encoded for you into this little small black box that you don't have to understand, right? And in fact, you can do everything the matrices do manually without the matrices. You, you can basically decode all of these operations that are compressed and encoded into the matrix and just do it yourself. The only thing matrices do is that they make it concise but at the same time, they make it obscure. So when you're learning things, they kind of stay in your way, right? So, and that's why I don't really like them when I like studying things, because I don't like this abstraction. You know, you know what I mean, right? So it's like, I, I want to learn how do I project a thing on the screen? I start Google that and like everywhere I go, they tell me, oh, just take this little black box and just put it into your program and don't think about it. 
I don't understand how the black box works. Like, can we talk about that? No, 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 no. This is a black box. A smarter people than you already came up with that. Don't question it. Just put that black box into the... Like, I want to learn things. That's why I don't like mattresses, like, when I learn things. They are useful when you're actually, like, doing production stuff and, and stuff like that. But when you're learning, they just, like, obscure so much stuff from you. It's just insane. It's like, you want to learn how to do things and like everyone tells you, oh, just use this library. Don't understand how it works, just, just use it. Don't question things. Am I the only one like that? I, I feel like I'm weird because everyone just chooses the path of just memorizing all of these mattresses without understanding how they work and just like call it a day. Um, maybe I'm just weird. Mm. Oh, the same for you. Yeah, that's actually pretty cool. Um, because, like, I do not undermine the usefulness of mattresses. I do think that they're a good way to compress and encode, um, you know, operations on, on vectors. But that is useful when you actually want to compress and encode operations on vectors. When you're learning those operations, that's like the opposite of what you want. Completely opposite of what you want. Um... <clears throat> Anyways, I'm sorry. I'm renting again. Keep renting and renting and renting. Okay. I feel like I feel really old. I think I'm getting older. Anyway. Um Q. Alright. So as you can see in here, I is located at 000, right? So we can even uh, you know do know that like so. So uh, I is located at 000. So now look, here is the I. Um, here's another eye. Uh, I'm not sure if I can, like, you know, uh, maybe like this. So here's the eye, another eye, another eye, another eye, another eye, another eye, another eye. If you replace all of them with zeros, what you're gonna end up with? So, uh, let's quickly try to do that. So maybe I'm gonna actually do it like this. Mm -hmm. If we assume that uh, E is equal to 0, 0, 0, uh, and then I'm going to put a line, and then I'm going to query replace E underscore. Actually, I want to query replace with a regular expression E underscore and just a single letter in here, and I want to replace all of that with 0. There we go. So, a boom. Cool. So this is what we have, which means that we can quite easily get rid of all of the minus zero, like so, and all of the plus zero, like though. I mean, okay, so it didn't work for some reason, so I can just put it like that. Uh, there we go. So this is what we ended up with. And of course, it probably makes sense to get rid of all of the parentheses. Can I just like get rid of them like so? And it's, uh, boom, boom. Uh -huh. Boom, there we go. So the only thing that matters in here is the uh, basically position of the screen. But we can assume that uh, position of the screen is one, right? Uh, let's say and s uh, z is equal to one. Uh, we can query replace s underscore z with one. There we go. And this is what we end up with. Right, so this is one. And uh, as you know, if you multiply by one, you end up with the same uh, value. So this is basically the formula for projecting the point onto the screen. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay. Uh, so essentially, if you assume that your eye is located at zero, 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 and the screen is in front of you with a distance one, and all of the objects are behind that specific screen, you can project them onto the, uh, onto the screen with just this. With different parameters, the formula may be a little bit different, but in that case, just use this formula. Right, just use this one. Uh, and um, OpenGL uses normalized coordinates, meaning that the objects are expected to be located in minus one, one uh, in X, minus one, one in Y, and I think in terms of Z, they're expected to be located at zero, one, right? We can do the same, right? So essentially, we can just locate objects in that specific space. Uh, we can shift that space behind the screen, 
project whatever we had onto the screen and we can take the projected points and just render them on the screen. <clears throat> um, and some people say that rendering is hard, it's just division. Yeah, so actual rendering is rather easy. It's understanding how to come up with this formula is hard. Right. So first you need to just draw this entire diagram and put some objects behind the screen and see how you can project. And you need to notice that this is a line and projecting is effectively finding a point on a line knowing X. So in this case, we know the X, we just need to find the Y of that, uh, of that thing. And to do that, you just use the usual uh, line formula and eventually you just end up with this thing. Uh, so yeah, that's basically what we have. So maybe I would like to uh, clean up this thing a little bit because, so for instance, here I have P1 and P2, but here I refer to just P and P prime. So I would like to say something like, um, when, uh, when we refer to uh, P, we mean either p p1 or p2 and the same goes for this one when we refer to p prime right we mean either p uh, p prime one or p prime two right so essentially when i say p i mean either of these points right it doesn't matter which one so either of them uh, so I think that's quite important. And another thing I need to say is that um, mm, let's say that P prime should be equal to P uh, prime X and P uh, prime Y. This is the things that we're trying to find. And the um, Z for that point is equal to the Z of the screen. So we can just say uh, SZ, right? There we go. Okay, so that's basically what we have. Uh, so this is the P prime. So uh, the follower is 07, thank you so much for the which prime, thank you, thank you, thank you. For P prime. Mm -hmm. mm -mm. The formula to find P prime is this one. Uh, if we assume uh, that that and that, so we end up with this entire thing. So that is pretty freaking cool. Uh, you know what I want to do? I want to go ahead and actually commit this PDF for anyone to like study and play with. Um, all right. So introduce 3D projection white paper. Oh my God, this sounds so fancy. <sighs> Like, I feel like I'm a, some sort of like a scientist who writes white papers and publishes them to the internet. This is so freaking cool. Isn't that cool? I think it's very cool. Right. Mm. So it gives me the sense of validation, right? So it feels like I'm doing something useful for the humanity. Uh, in fact, I, I'm, I'm not, but I mean, anyway. So if you want to read this PDF, right? You can find it in here. So uh, here it is. And of course, there's a tech file, right? So you can also play with that. So I'm going to uh, put it in here. Uh, there you go. There you go. There you go. So this is how you project onto the screen. And in fact, as far as I know, like OpenGL does basically that, right? So yeah. So in OpenGL, you have to project yourself. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So in modern OpenGL, you have to project yourself. Like I remember that in OpenGL 1.0, you could say, okay, use the special project projection matrix that that is built in into OpenGL, and it will just do all of that stuff for you automatically. I remember that in OpenGL, like starting from two or three, you just have to do all of that in the vertex shader yourself. So yeah. Mm. Mm. And I remember when I discovered that. I was so freaking upset. In fact, OpenGL 2.0 is the most disappointing thing compared to OpenGL 1.0. Because for the sake of control, they basically got rid of everything good from OpenGL 1.0. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> I really like how the first version of OpenGL just does everything for you automatically. You could just like initialize this library and there you go, you can do 3D. It's just like you do 3D. OpenGL 2, you have to do so freaking much to just render a cube. It's insane. It's just like shaders, compile shaders, project things around. Like, why do I have to do that? It was so nice. I could just initialize it and have a cube. It was so cool. But they got rid of that because you need control. You need a fine control. You need to be able to control each individual pixel. <laughs> If you don't want this kind of control, just use the engines that smarter people than you created and shut the fuck up. So that's basically what the industry constantly tells me. Sorry. <laughs> it's, 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 it's fine. I'm just, I'm just uh, half joking. Anyway. Uh, so let's actually try to play with that idea right so let's create a simple program that uh, just creates a bunch of points in 3d space and projects them onto the screen and maybe animate that and see how we can turn that into like a solid triangle uh, right so let's create maybe separate folder I'm gonna call it uh, 3d proj right so I'm gonna do that in a separate folder in here because I'm gonna be experimenting with things and uh, let's create main dude C, right? So let's do include stdio, uh, and I'm gonna do main, and I'm gonna just do uh, print f, hello world, right? I'm gonna clang, enable all of the possible warnings, and I'm gonna just try to compile this entire thing. And if I run this entire stuff, as you can see, it says hello world. I forgot a new line. Uh, okay. So we have a pretty cool thing, uh, all right? So as I already said, we have demos, all right? Uh, so I can do a triangle SDL, and this is how demos look like, right? So all of this stuff is rendered using the the graphics library, but on top of the gra graphics library, we uh, I developed a special thing that makes it easier to compile and like create demos, which is called VC or Virtual Console. Essentially, what you have to do, you have to include the VC, which also include Alivet. Um, you create uh, the, the canvas and you create a method to render. You just render everything into the pixels and you return um, the canvas from the render. And everything else is done uh, by this uh, thing automatically. Everything, absolutely everything. And this is actually kind of cool. Let me, let me, let me show you. So uh, it, it's so freaking cool that I'm thinking I should make this a separate library as well, or maybe include it into the main library. <laughs> it's kind of funny how like the auxiliary library just for the demos looks more cool than the library itself that I'm developing, which is kind of kind of weird, uh, but I'm gonna show you. Anyway, so in this case, you don't even have to have um, um, any entry point, right? So what you have to do, you have to include uh, vc.c, right? But it's located somewhere here, right? It's located at demos, uh, right? So then uh, we're going to create Olivet um, canvas render and we accept delta t. Uh, so it does animation, right? It creates animation and it actually uh, provides you delta time, basically the period of time uh, between the frames in seconds and it's flow that means you have a fractional part of the seconds uh, so let's actually define the size of the canvas for ourselves All right so this is going to be height and let's allocate this entire thing so it's going to be pixels uh, width multiplied by height so width multiplied by height so let's create a canvas super quick uh, oc all of that uh, canvas so I provide the pixels then width then height then stride right and then I return this entire thing so let's actually uh, fill it up with something uh, fill OC and let's fill it with a gray color like so cool so I didn't have to do anything else I literally don't have to do anything else what I have to do I have to compile this entire thing Right, so, but it cannot find the olivets uh, anywhere, so what I have to do is maybe put, uh, like, improve the include path, right? So I'm going to put the include path in here. 
Uh, okay, so you also have to define the platform macro, like for which platform you want to compile this demo, right? And there are three platforms, like Wasm, SDL, or Terminal. Uh, right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to provide the platform uh, platform um, SDL. I want to do SDL platform. But if I'm, if, if I'm going to be doing the SDL platform, I also need to link with SDL. So let's quickly do that as well. Uh, link SDL2. There we go. And as you can see, it created a window. Uh, but now, right, so I don't use uh, the T, so I can actually put uh, the T in here. Uh, I can, for instance, uh, render a circle, right, at the center. The center is located at here. Um, and the radius is going to be, let's say, 100. And the color is going to be something reddish, right? So let's actually quickly do that. Uh, and there we go. So as you can see, it works. Um, so, and it automatically will adapt it for different platforms. Uh, let's actually create build sh, right? So a script that will build everything for us, bin sh. And in, a, uh, in here, we're gonna copy paste this thing. Right, so I'm compiling this thing for SDL, but now I can try to compile it for the terminal platform. Right, so this is gonna be the terminal, but I, in that case, I don't need SDL. So let's actually try to uh, build this entire thing. So I need to make this stuff executable. Uh, build this edge. There we go. So if I'm gonna be compiling for terminal platform, I need to say how much is gonna be scaled down, right? Because for the terminal, we need to scale the image down a little bit because otherwise it's, it's not going to fit for the terminal because the resolution is too high. Uh, do you have a terminal with like 800 uh, characters wide? That's a huge freaking terminal, right? You need to scale it down. Uh, how much we're going to be scaling it down? Uh, let's actually scale it down by maybe 20. So it has to be the number that is divisible by both width and height, right? So that has to be a thing. Uh, right, so it seems to be working. And now uh this thing should work in the terminal as well so uh -huh. so if i go to 3d approach um oh i just realized that for the terminal i forgot to give it a special name right so it's called both sdl right main term so there we go so this is this is the thing Right, so this is literally the same code. This is literally the same code. It's just like it allows you to render in the terminal or in SDL, uh, right? And in fact, right, so the demos that you have in here, like for instance, this one, uh, build squish, squish SDL, right? So this is the demo that I have in here. Uh, there is a version for the terminal and it's done automatically. So this, this kind of stuff is done automatically, <laughs> right? So, and I'm saying this library for demo is cooler than the graphics library itself to the point that I'm actually thinking maybe I have to merge them somehow. Uh, right, so because it's kind of cool. It's, it's kind of like Love2D, but as a single file and for C. You know what I mean? So there is this Love2D game engine, which is basically like a distro of Lua, SDL bindings, some box 2 d bindings, and you know some like common uh, libraries for game developments, like all of that glued together, duct taped together, and called an engine. That's basically what Love to d is, <laughs> right? And to create a game, you basically specify three methods like render, update, and some stuff for handling the. Uh, the input and it just does everything for you automatically. It kind of, I did kind of like this, but for C and as a single file, which is kind of cool, right? And it's way simpler than Love to Do, of course. So it's way simpler. Uh, and on top of that, this thing you can compile to WebAssembly. Can you compile Love to Do to WebAssembly? Uh, is that the thing that is supported for Love to Do? So the game distribution. Uh, because as I was already said, you can compile all of this, uh, all of this stuff for WebAssembly, and it will work in the browser, like this, for instance. As you can see, all of that stuff works in browser. Uh, so WebAssembly distribution for the web. Oh, I remember how it does that. 
yeah essentially there is like a single bundle for love to d that is interpreted by the runtime and what they did they just implemented like the interpreter for browser right so we can take the same love file and just put it okay i see i see what they did eh, kind of meh anyway i mean it works so who cares anyway i'm not saying that it's, it's a bad thing or anything it's just like not my thing mm. Uh, all right, so let's introduce uh, a bunch of vectors, right? So since we're going to be projecting 3D to 2D, it would be nice to maybe have a definition for these vectors, right? So let's have a vector 2, uh, float x and y, right? So this is a 2D vector, and let's have a 3D vector. So, um, I don't know, I, I kind of like following the terminology of Jai, and in Jai there is types vector 2 and vector 3. And on top of that, you also have methods make vector two, uh, which accepts float x, float y. Uh, all right, and essentially what it does is vector two v two uh, v two x x y y, and just returns v two. And maybe we can copy paste that stuff. Mm. Can your pen and paper do that? Mm? Can your pen and paper do that? I don't think so. You can't copy paste shit on the pen and paper. Uh, imagine being a pen and paper friend in 2022. Cringe, bro. Truly cringe. Uh, career replace. You can't even career replace on paper. Okay, so this is gonna be easy. There we go. Uh, so. You know what? I think I want to make a small break before I continue developing this thing and just make a cup of tea, right? So let's make a small break and make a cup of tea. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and implement this thing, right? So we have a 2D vector and 3D vector. So the thing we need to do, we need to be able to project a 3D vector to 2D space, right? So let's call it project uh, 2D, 3D, I guess. I guess it's a, it's a good name. So we're gonna accept uh, vector 3D uh, and then uh, it's going to return vector 2. And as we already determined, uh, where is my paper? Where is my scientific paper that I've wrote? Where is it? Uh, here it is, I need to open it. Mm. Right, according to that paper, that I wrote in front of you, we just have to take the X and Y coordinates, right, and just divide them by Z. Right, that's what we need to do. Um, okay, so but we have to be careful uh, when um, z becomes zero. This is actually rather interesting. Look, look, this formula is not defined when p z is equal to zero. So p z is equal to zero um, is when it is at the same place as i. It's kind of interesting, right? If we are sort of modeling the physical process here where you have an eye, you have a screen and you have an object behind the screen. And we have this simple mathematical model that describes that process. If you take an object and stick it to the eye, that specific case is not defined and leads uh, to division by zero, right? If you have an object and it just goes into your eye, that's division by zero. <laughs> Which is kind of funny if you think about it, uh, right? So, it, it, like division by zero not being defined has some sort of interesting meaning, uh, right? It cannot be seen anyway. Yeah. Hmm. What's interesting is, is that if it's negative, uh, I guess it just gets reverted. Yeah, it kind of gets reverted. Uh, wearing contacts is dividing by zero, but it doesn't go inside of the eye inside of the eyeball mm -mm. Mm -mm. Zaldin, my heroes thanks for adding compiler regex to jaimon they're kind of broken actually so it can only parse the first error message but if there's two of them the second one is fucked up <laughs> right so feel free to fix it I, I'm not really I didn't look into how to fix that but yeah so you can only parse the the first one 
I kind of fucked up that regular expression. Anyway, so, <clears throat> excuse me. We need to take V3, X, and effectively divide it by uh, Z. Uh, right, and the same thing we need to do with Y, right? And we're going to have this thing. There we go. You know what's funny? After we projected this entire stuff, right? After we projected this entire stuff on the screen, we cannot just put that on the like usual screen, right? So because the points, the values of the points are going to be from minus one to one, from minus one to one, right? So because we're going to be using normalized coordinates like in OpenGL. Mm -hmm. So another thing we need to do, we need to be able to project that 2D point onto the actual screen device, right? And the screen device has a completely different coordinate system, right? At the uh, left top corner, it has zero, zero. And the Y coordinate goes down, which is like completely different from how we mathematically modeled all of that. So what we need to do, we need to take this normalized 2D coordinate and map it to the screen, <laughs> right? Otherwise we won't be able to properly render it. Uh, right, so this is going to be V2, and this thing should be in, in screen coordinates, and yeah, that's that should be fine. So, um, here's the thing. So we have Vx, which is uh, within the range of minus 1 to 1. What we need to do, we need to turn it into the range of uh, from 0 to width of the screen. Um, okay, so how are we going to be doing all of that? Well, we can basically add... Um, okay, so I'm going to put equals in here. Equals in here. And here I'm going to say this is what we want to achieve. But what it, this is what it's equal to. If I add 1 to x, its range is going to be from 0 to 2. Right, it's from 0 to 2. Then what I can do, I can divide this thing by 2 and I'll map it to the range from 0 to 1. And after that, I can multiply it by width, and I'll get a range from 0 to width. There we go. So this is what we've got. Uh, so this is the first uh, thing that we need to do in here. Okay. Uh, the next thing is uh, y. y is from, again, minus 1 to 1. But what we want to have is uh, from zero to height. But it's kind of interesting. It's kind of tricky because uh, y points at a different direction. So at some point, we'll have to invert it, if you know what I mean. Right, so we can do the same thing, plus one uh, divided by two, which will effectively turn it into a range from zero to one. Right, after that, we can invert it. Right, minus one which kind of turns it into a range from 1 to 0. And maybe that's precisely what we want to actually achieve in here. We want to do from minus 1 to 1 to from that to that. But it kind of looks looks weird and not mathematical, right? Because we have a bigger value at the left, which is kind of... Eh. Anyway, but that's the way we indicate that we're inverting this entire thing. And then if we multiply it by height, this is precisely what we'll get in here. Okay, so here are two points. Two, two coordinates, right? So we map that to the screen. So, and this is the stuff that can be used as a center for the circle to indicate uh, the the point, right? That we projected onto the screen. Okay, so let's try to draw a triangle at some at some place, right? Um, so the triangle, where the triangle is going to be located? So uh, at screen, at one we have a screen. And um, we're going to say that all of the objects have to fit from 1 to 2, right? So they all have to fit somewhere here, from 1 to 2. So let's uh, put a triangle in the middle of that. So it's going to be 1.5. This is where it's going to be located, 1.5. So I'm, I'm going to even put some sort of like a Z. Uh, 1.5. This is where it's like it. Um, so... Now let's create three points. So vector three, so A, make vector three. Um, 
So let's actually define two legs, right? So two bottom legs, minus five, minus half, and minus half at the same z. So this is the left leg. The right leg is positive x. And then at the center, we have the sort of like head. It's located at zero, uh, but here we're gonna have, uh, you know, half. So these are three points, right? These are three points. What we can do with these three points is essentially project them to 2D. Project to uh, 3D, 2D, right? We just projected that, just projected that. Then after we projected this entire thing, we need to project 2D onto the screen. There we go. So, and in here we have like, you know, this kind of stuff. Cool. So we projected this entire stuff. So now we may want to draw uh, three points. Let's actually go ahead and draw three points. Uh, in Olive C, Olive C, what is it called? Circle, right? So this is going to be a circle. Uh -huh. So this is OC. The center is going to be A, X, A, Y. So vector is actually flows, but here we accept integers, but that's fine because it's going to be uh, converted uh, to integers anyway. Uh, here I'm going to put like 10 and the color is going to be something like, uh, let's put red, because why not? This one is going to be uh, B and this one is going to be uh, C. There we go. So if I try to compile this entire thing, it does not compile. Why? Because I forgot to return this entire thing, but that's fine because I'm using statically typed language, which just tells me the thing that I have to do. So uh, 3D... Okay, why did I call this 2D, 3D? I want to do 3D, 2, 2D. There we go. So it's the other way around. Q. So now, after that, um, I probably also want to actually indicate what exactly am I building, right? So I need to trace this entire stuff. Cool. As you can see, we build SDL and we build term. So uh, now I want to start this entire thing. And as you can see, we have three points. It's kind of difficult to see that they're in 3D space, but trust me, they are in a 3D space projected onto the screen. Trust me. <laughs> Source, trust me, bro. Uh, so we can try to do some interesting things, right? We can try to do some interesting things. For instance, we can uh, animate um, Z axis, right? So as you can see, Z, we put it like somewhere in the middle. Um, between uh, between the screen and the far uh, far surface, far cutting surface. So we'll put it somewhere here. We can try to basically make it closer or more far away, right? So we can animate it like that. Um, so let's do the following thing. So we can animate it according to the time, but to animate it according to the time, we need to keep track of the global time. Uh, global time equal to zero and it's actually rather easy so every time we render the next frame we just increment the global time uh, variable and we have the current time mm -mm. so after that um, we can take that global time and we can use it as an angle for the sign and that gives us a value that fluctuates from minus one to one, right? Which is kind of, kind of important. Um, so if we try to literally add this thing to here, uh, if sine f becomes minus one, it will go below one. It will go below one, below one uh, and uh, it go, you know, in front of us. It basically will pop out of the screen. Um, so thank you so much, Anonymous, for gifting tier one sub to Tsodin Loves Rust. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so essentially what we want to do, we want to maybe multiply that by half. And when you multiply it by half, the range is going to be minus 0, 0.5, 0, 0.5. So that means the... Uh, one of the, the closest it will go, it will go right at the screen, uh, which is not ideal. We probably want to actually multiply it by 25, right? In that case, it's going to fluctuate like 
you know, in a quarter from minus 0 0.25 to 0, uh, to 0 0.25. So I think that's a rather good way to do that. So let's do build dot sh and let's just run this entire thing. So okay, we're starting to use math, uh, which means that we probably want to link it with math uh, library as well. There we go. Uh, okay. And as you can see, it is fluctuating, which is okay, I suppose. Maybe it should actually go from 0 0.5, so maybe it's it's actually not enough. Maybe it's not enough. Uh, predator aiming, yeah. So here is an interesting, uh, like, the effect that I was talking about. We're moving this thing in z-axis further away, closer away like right so basically just like moving it in front of you and the farther away it is the more closer to the center these points become right and which is precisely the effect i was talking about uh, when i was writing the paper right uh so let's take a look so if i go to to here right and let's let's do it like that mm, where is P. Uh, and for instance, I can change it to 5, All right? And then PDF uh, 3D projection tech, All right? So as you can see, it went a little bit further, uh, but this thing uh, went closer to the center, right? So we change them to 3, uh, they actually go from the center. Right, so the more far away, the more it vanishes at the center. And this is precisely the effect we can see when we're actually trying to render 3D. So that's precisely that effect. See? So, like in the paper, I demonstrated that in like one dimension. Here we have this effect in two dimensions. And by two dimensions, I mean the dimensions of the screen. Right, it's, it's literally the same effect. Here we, we have it animated. Right, which is rather cool, I think. I just personally find it cool. Uh, right, I know such a simple math, um, but it, it's kind of cool. Anyways, uh, anyways, 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 but it's not really that interesting. It doesn't really look like 3D or anything like that. Right, it would be interesting if it was actually rotating in front of us. Right. If I had it like a pivot of rotation pointing up, like a Y axis, and it was rotating around that pivot. You know what I mean? So it will be kind of interesting like that. Right. So let's actually try to do that. Uh, let's try to do that. So let's maybe keep uh, Z as it is or maybe not actually maybe maybe we can rotate it and also change the z it's too complicated we can edit later right so this is going to be z and uh let's introduce the angle of rotation for that triangle and it's going to be it's going to be literally global time so that means it doesn't really matter okay so let me think so since i'm uh, animating the first two legs. Okay, so here we have uh, two legs. Uh, in terms of Y, those legs are located in here at the same place, right? They are located at the same place. But then what we're gonna do, we're gonna use X as X. We're gonna do cosine global time, right? So this is a cosine global time. We're gonna do Z as uh, y uh, sine f global time right and it's going to basically rotate around zero zero but we want it to rotate uh, around this thing okay mm. all right that's pretty cool uh, so i'm gonna actually no no i'm gonna actually keep this in, keep this in here uh, so the second leg, uh, the second leg is going to be the same, except it's going to be 180 degrees lagging, meaning that I need to add pi. Uh, right, so I need to add pi. Uh, let me define quickly pi. 
Um, there we go. Uh, can I just copy paste that stuff? Thank you, thank you so much. All right. So that should be fine actually. So let me try to run this. Okay, that is that is rotating in a really strange way, <laughs> right? Uh, but it is rotating. It is rotating nonetheless. Um, so effectively, that's so weird because it's around X. Oh, th this is because they're yeah, I see. Because they're too big. Uh, one of the things we want to do in here, we probably want to multiply it by like 0, 0,5. Uh, 0, 0,5. Mm -hmm. And I think that should make it a bit better. Uh -huh. Yeah, there we go. So the triangle is kind of rotating around this like single axis. We can clearly see that. Uh, all right, that's pretty cool. And now, since we have these three points, right, since we have these three points, instead of drawing the circles, we can literally just go ahead and do the triangle because we have a thing that allows you to render a triangle. Uh, where is that? Oh, that's tri triangle. Yeah, there we go. So let's actually use this stuff. Mm -hmm. So this is OC. I wonder if I can do the following thing. So I'm using numbers in here, which means that it probably makes sense to rename this stuff to P1, P2, P3. So it's a little bit easy to use Emacs magic for me, like so. And let's do the following stuff. 18, 18, FF. Uh -huh. And as you can see, we have a triangle, which is rotating. So there's some warnings in here, which I probably want to fix. Uh, so the warnings come from the sine and cosine not being defined. Uh, let's actually quickly define them. I should probably include math uh, header, but I don't want to include it because I want to try to compile it in the um, in the WASM environment. In the WASM environment, we usually don't use standard library. Um, right, so let's quickly do that. I, I don't remember if I have to provide something in here. I, I don't know. Well, let me see. Seems fine. Okay, so it doesn't complain about anything. That's pretty cool. And as I already mentioned, our sort of like library allows you to also run it in the terminal if you want to, right, without like any any problem or any additional coding, you can just take the same thing and you have a 3D rotating triangle in the terminal. It's it, it's the same code. <laughs> Isn't that cool? I think it's pretty cool. Just like you have a rotating in 3D triangle uh, in your terminal. <laughs> Holy shit. Uh, anyway, so... Okay. Mm, but... Here's another thing. Recently, we implemented uh, Triangle 3, which actually accepts three colors. What if we use Triangle 3 and just try to render a rainbowish triangle? How about a little bit of a rainbowish triangle? Uh, right? You know, the OpenGL style rainbowish triangle. Let me see. How is it going to look like? This is not OpenGL. This is not OpenGL. This is not OpenGL. This is entirely on CPU. Uh, Anonymous, thank you so much for gifting the sub to cellophane11578. And it looks like 3D, it's like rotating. As, as you can see, it's like, if you track the color of this angle, it stays red. It's like red actually feels like it's rotating. Uh, that's so cool. <laughs> that's so freaking cool. And again, it's not OpenGL. We render this triangle pixel by pixel on CPU, on the freaking CPU. That's so cool. And we basically reinvented and understood we didn't just use the math as a black object, we, we implemented and understood the whole math. 
that goes into doing this precise thing. Uh, and since we're doing that pixel by pixel, yet again, we can run it in a terminal. In a terminal, we don't really have colors. Or do we? Which is actually a good point. We can actually introduce like a course with the ANSI. Let me actually put it to do about that. What the fuck? Why didn't I, why didn't I do that? Okay, demo VC um, term platform uh, char color to char um, use ANSI terminal colors uh, for color to char. Like, why the fuck don't we use colors in here? Like, I mean, terminals do support colors. We could have just, like, mapped that appropriately and make it even cooler. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, thank you so much for, for the gifting subs. Uh, Valenie, thank you so much for gifting sub to Mr. Botka and Real Vesala. Thank you so much for Twitch Prime. Um, this is a perspective projection. Right, uh, at the beginning of the stream, we basically reinvented it by just doing this math, right, you know. So we imagine that we have an eye, we have a screen, and we have some points behind the screen. We just connected the dots and we figured out that, yeah, this is the formula that we have to use. And we just use this formula to project things behind the screen onto the screen. And that's basically how we did that, right? We didn't use any, you know, matrices or any like magic uh, that we don't understand every all of the math was actually super straightforward um can you please scale final image by character aspect it's actually kind of difficult because i have no idea what font you're using i mean i can spend some time like figuring out what's the current font in the terminal or maybe there is a way to do that. Like, I don't know. Is there any way uh, in a terminal being a term like a console program to know the aspect ratio of the of the character? Is there any way? I I'm not sure, actually. So maybe there is. If there is, pl please let me know. I'm going to use that and I'm going to implement that. Uh, but all of that, like the actual representation of the terminal seems kind of abstracted away from the terminal programs. You know what I mean? It's just like the only thing the terminal programs can do is just like throw some, some characters and hope that they look good, but they don't really know how exactly they're going to look. So, uh, let me continue. What I wanted to do... Mm, what I wanted to do... Yeah, I wanted to actually compile that to WebAssembly. How can we compile it to WebAssembly? Uh, let me see. So this is a 3, 3D project. Uh, so the way we compile to WebAssembly is just by saying the platform is going to be Wasm and we're going to call it Wasm. We're not going to link it with uh, math or anything like that because it's not particularly linkable. And uh, we're going to say that the target is going to be Wasm32. Right. If we try to compile this entire stuff, how is it going to work? Okay, so what does it say? It's cannot link it with this libc library right because it's it's wasm but that's fine we don't plan to link with libc so let's actually say no standard uh libraries right no standard libraries so what else do we have in here so it also complains that there is no entry point that's totally fine let's tell the linker that we don't want any entry point no entry Okay, what else do we have in here? And that's totally fine, right? But the final Wasm executable is actually 102 bytes. 102 bytes. So if we convert it to what, right? If we decompile it, uh, we'll notice that it actually contains nothing, right? So it only exports memory and a stack pointer, and that is it. Everything else was illuminated because we haven't exported anything. Uh, right. So what we need to do is now tell the linker, please export a render. Uh, export render. So we're going to try to recompile this entire step. I mean, recompile this entire step. 
Okay, so, and when we try to recompile, that function that got eliminated is trying to use sine and cosine, which are located in the math library, but they're undefined. In that case, we can say, uh, okay, linker, allow undefined, because those undefined functions are going to be provided by the JavaScript runtime anyway. There we go. And uh, as you can see, we compile it. And now the final executable is 9.3 kilobytes, which is kind of big. We can make it a little bit smaller by optimizing for size. Right? Uh, right. And it's actually 2 kilobytes. We can try to decompile it and see what it turned into. All right. And what we have in here. And as you can see, we have the render method. We have the memory and stuff like that. And everything seems to be fine. Everything seems to be fine. Right. So essentially, like, how do you even run this thing in WebAssembly? Because it requires setting up an environment and stuff like that. Well, there is for this sort of like a demo uh, library, there is a JavaScript runtime, right? So vc.js, right? You provide this JavaScript runtime and it just makes that demo work in browser as well right it just implements whatever is required for for that specific thing and it's actually good reminding me that i'll need heap base as well right so i need to export heap base and heap base is basically a name uh that tells the web assembly where you can start using memory because how c program compiled to web assembly works like how it lays out its data so at the beginning of the memory it puts the data read only data then after that comes the stack that grows towards the zero, towards the data. And after that goes the heap. And everything after the heap, you can use that to implement, for instance, malloc. If you do like dynamic allocations, you can basically put that after the heap base. And that's why this heap base, that symbol is so important. It tells the JavaScript runtime like from where it can start using memory of the of the web assembly right and it's quite important because uh what it need to do sometimes it needs to allocate a little bit of memory and give a pointer to that allocated memory back to c so c can put something there so the javascript can actually extract it from there you see what i mean right so and to be able to do that it needs to know where it is safe to actually use the memory from from which point Right, and at that point is determined by a symbol called heap base. It, it basically a global variable that locates like a pointer. Like from here, you can use whatever you want. Um, so I think you can even Google more information about that if you do clang web assembly uh, heap base. So there is a pretty cool um, article on that. Uh, where you can find it? Why is it in Russian? God damn it. Uh, seems to be missing WebAssembly, Clang WebAssembly. Compiling C and running it. Uh, if you can find that article, it actually has a colorful background and stuff like that. It's actually like, that's the article everyone suggests to read when it comes to Clang and WebAssembly, but I can't find it right now because Google doesn't want to show me that. Anyway, uh, so. Yeah, so we need to export uh, heap base. Right, let's try to compile this into it. Yeah. Jir, thank you so much for Twitch Prime. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I promise you nickname correctly. So, and now if I take a look, do we have heap base? There we go. We have a heap base and it's a global variable. Okay, good. Uh, now, what I want to do. Right. So we compiled this thing properly into like was a module. Now we need to create HTML file because I mean, it, we run this stuff in, in the browser. Uh, so let's do the usual stuff, right? So this is HTML. Uh, where is my HTML actually? Excuse me. Yeah, there we go. Can I do stuff like this? Uh, right, so this is gonna be hat. And then uh, we're going to have a title and 3D triangle there we go. then we need to have a body uh, there we go so this is the body and everything is rendered into the canvas uh, canvas and let's give it ID app right so we created a canvas 
After that, we need to include the JavaScript runtime for the virtual console. And after we included the JavaScript runtime for the virtual console, we say, okay, start demo at canvas app and use the wasm module main.wasm. There you go. So here is the canvas into which it's going to be rendered. And here is the module, was a module that you have to use for the demo. And it should start the demo for you. Uh, okay, so uh, let me copy paste the JavaScript runtime. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to start the browser. Uh, HTTP server 6969. Uh, okay, so the server is already running apparently. Uh, let me find all of them. Yeah, here it is. Uh, so let's actually restart this entire stuff. And if I open it in here, uh, something went wrong. Let's see what went wrong. Uh, can it read property buffer? All right, that's very interesting. Uh, at 66. So it doesn't have... Oh, I accidentally typed something in there. It's not a G memory. It's not a G man. Uh, all right, there we go. So as you can see, it works in, in browsers as well. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so that's what's cool about this, like a library for compiling demos. It's, yeah, you have a single program and it just works in all of these environments, in SDL and anywhere. So if you want to make it work in a browser, you just supply the JavaScript runtime and it will adapt everything for you as well. <laughs> I think it's even cooler than the original idea of the library. What do you think? <laughs> Uh, I, th I think I should merge these two ideas somehow. I think it's kind of cool. Wonder what's the size difference with O2? Uh, I don't know. Why is that important? Okay. Uh, specifically what? We're compiling it to three different executables. All right. So we do a lot of things in here. Um... 2.5. Anyway, uh, so what I wanted to do. Yeah, so here it's cool and all. Everything here is cool and all. But the problem starts to arrive when we have two triangles that intersect with each other. Right. So let's actually try to create that. It should be relatively easy to create such triangle. Uh, right. Essentially, let's create a second rotating triangle, but lagging um, 90 degrees, right? So let's actually do it like this. I'm going to actually put it uh, here. Uh, I can probably create a separate scopes, right? So we do not, um, you know, pollute or shadow anything. There we go. So, and how can we make it lag 90 degrees? So 90 degrees is in fact pi, or how much is it? Uh, it's, it's half of a pi. Yeah, it's, it's half of a pi. So we can do pi and half. So we can effectively add half of a pi to all of this stuff to make it lag 90 degrees, right? So, and if we try to recompile all of this, if we try to recompile all of this. Um, okay, so there's a floating point. So it, that means there is a division by zero somewhere. Let, let me find where. Um, so let me put ggdb. Uh -huh. This is not what I wanted. I wanted to recompile this thing. Thank you very much. Okay, gdb main sdl and uh, let's run it. Okay, it's somewhere in mix call. Oh, okay, that's that's rather easy. Uh, so all of it. Mm -hmm. Mix callers three. So we got a situation where Dan is actually zero. That's basically what we got. Well, I mean, we can do something like if Dan not equal to zero, only then do this entire stuff. Otherwise, uh, return zero. Right, so we can do something like that. Right. 
because if it's equal to zero, there is something wrong in here, and I'm not sure what exactly to even render there. So what's what's the point? Uh, okay, so this is a wrong folder. Uh, oh, come on. There we go. Mm, main SDL. And as you can see, it looks kind of weird, doesn't it? So they are not intersecting with each other. Why are they not intersecting with each other? Right, they were supposed to be like, yeah, like a cross, but they're not. Because one is rendered on top of another. Yeah, so, and how do you even solve that stuff? So usually, um, when you have several triangles and you want to render them and you want them appear in the correct order, you want to maybe sort them by Z. But here, sorting them by Z is not going to help you. It's not going to help you. It's just like a one is always going to be rendered on top of another, but you need to partially draw uh, one triangle and partially draw another one. How do you do that? So, this is very interesting because uh, remember how in the previous streams we implemented triangle interpolation, right? So essentially on the triangle, you can associate values with each individual vertex. And as you render pixel by pixel, you know how close you are to one um, vertex or another. And based on that, we compute the color of that pixel, creating this beautiful gradient. You can use this technique to associate any value with the vertex any value one of the values you can associate is z value right so for each vertex you know the z value of that thing and by using the in triangle interpolation you can compute the z value for each pixel and knowing the z values for each pixel you can actually compare how one pixel how pixel of one triangle is closer to you than the pixel of another triangle so this is called z-buffering, right? And we're going to implement that, but already on the next stream, because I already streamed for two hours, but this is basically like a, uh, you know, sneak peek into what we're going to do on the next stream, right? So having triangle interpolation allows you to know a z-value of a single pixel of a triangle, not just a single vertex, but like a single pixel. I can pick a pixel in a triangle and tell what's the Z value of that inside of the pixel. Using the triangle interpolation, I can do that. So that's the point of the uh, barycentric coordinates that we were like reinventing on the previous stream. Um, all right. So yeah, that's basically gonna be on the next stream. Does anyone have any questions? Was today a cool stream? By the way, I think today was actually a pretty cool stream. I really enjoyed it. <clears throat> Defeating an NVIDIA on CPU rendering pixel at a time, yeah. Mm, next stream when? I don't know when I feel like it. Uh, yeah, the schedule, don't, don't follow the schedule. Schedule is broken, so. For a moment, I couldn't tell if it was rotating right or left. It's like one of those, you know, puzzles is the picture rotating left or right it depends on your brain or something like that um it's a very cool stream thank you where can you find my emacs config there is a command called dot files right so yeah dot files command and you can find it in here uh. I don't know why everyone's so obsessed about my Emacs config. Mm, thank you, thank you guys for watching. Can we use different CPU scores for programming? Maybe. So what's interesting is that we can, yeah, maybe we can parallel parallelize this entire process like of rendering things and stuff like that. Basically split the screen into like four quads and do computations for each quad on different core. Why not? So, but one of the things uh, I want you to do, I want you to do vectorization. I want you to use like CMD instructions, but in, in the future, 
Do you tell beforehand on Twitter about your streams? Of course not. Twitter is gonna shadow ban that. <laughs> the thing about Twitter is that uh, this kind of stuff is really discouraged, discouraged by Twitter algorithm. If you start posting like a similar stuff, like a stream announcement, especially stream announcements that contain the, uh, the links to a different server that goes outside of the Twitter, it's gonna rank that specific tweet on their algorithm so freaking low, it's gonna be basically shadow banned, it's pointless. What Twitter wants you to do is to shed post that gets a lot of clicks and shares and likes and stuff like that, right? So that's why I don't do that on Twitter. Because I, I used to do that, but at some point the uh, the stream announcement just get zero interaction. It's just like nobody saw them. Because Twitter thinks it's spam, so it just like, you know, puts it down. Um, in fact, it's kind of pointless to advertise one social network using another social network because uh, social networks tend to have algorithms that that suppress that because they're competing with each other right so they're competing with each other twitter might be competing with twitch in some sense uh, twitter has like these rooms where you can talk and stuff like that so in that sense it's competing with twitch so it doesn't want people to leave twitter to go to twitch so it's gonna suppress that as much as possible um, mm, mm, mm. Alright, so I guess that's it for today. Thanks everyone who is watching me right now. I really appreciate it. Have a good one and I see you on the next recreational programming session. So yeah, love you. Mwah. Ah! Uh -huh.